Good afternoon. Oh, hope you had a good coffee. It helped you for the talk. Uh, and you can see what you can expect in the next half an hour, uh, roughly. But um, I will discuss some of previous experiments and some more recent ones and some, as you say, emergent experiments we are planning. Uh, we are working with neutrons, and uh, I think I have always to explain a little bit why neutrons, because it's matter waves, it has very well defined particle properties, but also wave properties, and they are connected by the Schrodinger equation, and we have a two-level system within a magnetic field, which can be adjusted. There we have also the Compton wavelengths, and therefore, also, that gives you a Compton frequency, and perhaps I can say a few words to that also. And uh, we're working mainly with the neutron interferometer. It's a perfect crystal, silicon crystal, where the lattice planes have to be parallel throughout the crystal, distance of about 10 centimeters. And then you get by Bragg diffraction a splitting of the beam and, uh, and, and the superposition. And the outgoing beams show typical interference phenomena when you here produce a phase shift either by materials or magnetic fields, gravitational fields, and so on. I should also mention that we are always in the regime of self-interference. At the time, there is only one neutron within the apparatus, and you, when you calculate, you can even say that the next one is not yet born. It is still in the fuel of the reactor. We have a very high efficiency for detector, polarizers, and spin flippers, and so on, but that works now routinely, uh, mainly at the ILL, at our Langevin Institute in Grenoble. Neutrons from the core are, are along a neutron guide. They are monochromatized, and then they come to the interferometer place, which is also shown here. And then there are the detectors where the events are counted. And in the meantime, we have different uh, types of interferometers, as it is shown here. And uh, that's a typical result uh, of these interferences, where you can see uh, quite high order interferences. And you see the envelope of these interferences gives you the, pack, the size of the wave packet as in optics. And you see here, you would get a longitudinal coherence. Here we have about 50. And to the middle, it would be in the order of about 100 angstrom. So we can measure the packets very accurately. That is not a problem. And um, you see, therefore, well, it's described by the Schrodinger equation, and the eigenvalue solution is the superposition of plane waves. And that I wanted to stress. And uh, you see that the coherence function is, uh, or this envelope is given by Fourier transform of the momentum distribution. And you also, I want, I want to say always is that these partial waves here uh, fill the whole space, not only where the packet is. And I showed that again. In, the, in this picture, you have a wave packet here, typically, but the components are always much larger or even infinite. So there is a lot outside the packet, which we do not take into account in most cases. We say only this is the important, but they are there, and there is no question, and they follow from also from the theory. You can now have this situation. Usually, one has may start with a Gaussian 
uh, packet. And then uh, when you have a thick phase shift, the packets become separated, completely separated, and you produce kind of Schrodinger cat states. And at the same time, when the interference pattern disappear, in the momentum distribution, these wiggles appear. So uh, that means when there is no interference anymore, there is still coherence, and there are still the waves there, and they appear here in the momentum distribution. So it is shifted from one parameter to the other ones. And you can uh, show that in terms of the Wigner function. You all know at zero order, you have Gaussian packets in uh, momentum and in ordinary space, the projection of that. And when you are in high order, where you have the Schrodinger cat states, you get separated packets, you can see in space, and a modulation in the momentum space, and all uh, that could be uh, measured, and measured mainly by means of post-selection methods in ordinary space, in momentum space, and in time space. And I really want to say it's, uh, or mention uh, that uh, they have more information, less mistakes due to post-selection. And that I want to stress. Uh, first of all, uh, post-selection in ordinary space. Look, when you really scan the whole beam cross-section, you see that the contrast is quite different in any places, and what you usually measure is the average of it. And so there's quite a difference. Or here is the internal phase which uh, is uh, always existing in any setup, and you see that it's varying also, and you are measuring the average, but you can get much more information by post-selection. Here is momentum post-selection. You see when you have here uh, this, uh, the situation that the packets do not overlap here because you have a thick phase shifter, then uh, they do not overlap, but when you uh, monochromatize or take a filter, you increase the size of the packets and they overlap. And then you see again interference pattern, whereas the whole beam does not show this interference anymore. And in the momentum space, you see, you see these Wiegels uh, that were the, was, were the first measurements. In the meantime, we see that much better. But in the momentum space, you see uh, the effect of the whole, in the whole beam, whereas the no normal interference disappears. And uh, only to show that again is uh, here uh, with this setup, with the two loop interferometers, we uh, can measure the momentum distribution. The blue one at low order, zero order, it's nearly Gaussian. And at higher order with a phase shifter in it, you see these Wiegels. And in ordinary space, you see at high order this uh, appearance of the Schrodinger cat state where the wave function have two distinct maxima. So that can be measured uh, explicitly. Also, you can make post-selection in the time domain. You have a chopper in front of that, and that produces you neutron bursts. That's not the packets, it's the burst, because the packets are much smaller. But you see there you can produce packets which are smaller than the, uh, uh, excuse me, bursts, smaller uh, than, shorter uh, than the dimension of the interferometer. And nevertheless, 
you can see again the interference pattern. That means even in this case where they are really uh, located inside the interferometer, uh, the interference pattern exists. And that shows you here that the faster components are in front of the burst, and so on. So you can get more information by means of such post-selections procedures. And I want also to mention that also in the EPR experiments, I guess it's quite clear that there would be more information than usually is extracted. When you have a transition from a long-lived state uh, to a stable one, and there's the metastable one, you know that these uh, K vectors have always to be constant. Okay, alpha and chi beta have to be constant, and your entangled state is given here. But please do not forget that there is also a spatial um, uh, part um, for, for both uh, uh, transitions, and when you take Gaussian packets here, you end up with an intensity here which has, again, this oscillatory term. And that means, as it is shown here, that only in the case when uh, K uh, alpha uh, uh, minus K beta, oh, here should be, yes, it's, it's constant, or minus when it is equal, you see here, only in this case, you have this idealized situation. But usually, in nearly all experiments, you have here, a, internal uh, pattern for each individual pairs because they have different k-vectors, they interfere at the right and at the left side, so at a certain distance you do not have all pairs. And therefore, you see, you have also much more information in a measurement than is usually extracted. And, but that could be uh, extracted. And uh, <coughs> that is one. And I wanted also to give you a little bit a more plausible uh, <coughs> explanation for the interferometer and the neutron case when the waves coming from uh, left and right are interfering uh, <coughs> at the position of the lattice. There is the possibility that the maximum are at the position of uh, the silicon atoms or the scattering atoms, or <coughs> it can be just in between them, in the middle of uh, these uh, atoms. In both cases, it's symmetric, and you get outgoing beams in both directions. But when the, uh, the, uh, the wave um, um, maximum are on an increasing part of the potential to the lattice atoms, you can imagine that that is the case, that in this case, the beam goes only in one direction. And when are uh, this maximum a little bit behind or the decreasing part, uh, branch of the potential, you get the intensity here. I want to show it and to give a more plausible, plausible uh, explanation, but uh, certainly uh, can be calculated as seen. You see also the quantum potential, we have heard a lot of that, uh, gives you some kind of uh, explanation, and uh, you see these well-known figures of the, of the quantum potential, uh, and here, uh, for a beam splitter, usually uh, that shows the situation. And yesterday, and I think also today, we have seen much better uh, figures for that. But it, uh, in principle, uh, <coughs> gives also an explanation. And uh, I want to show a few words to these weak measurements uh, I come to uh, is 
And that means, where well, usually you have here a phase shift, or you rotate it and get the pattern you have. When you introduce an absorber, then you can easily calculate that the intensity is, uh, the amplitude is reduced by the square root of the attenuation. And uh, when you have, uh, that is a statistical, a stochastic absorption, each neutron has the chance to be absorbed, whereas in an open, closed situation, when you have your wheel slowly uh, moving, you get a deterministic situation, and then the amplitude is proportional to the attenuation. That has been shown, and uh, as the formula says, for this situation, you see that here the stochastic attenuation. In both cases, you must know the same amount of neutrons are absorbed, but the interference pattern is considerably higher in the stochastic case than in the deterministic case. And even at very low transmission probability, where you have a very uh, small signal from one side, you see the difference becomes very big. And uh, you know, that is here a simulation by Hans de Red, and <laughs> our chair chairwoman. Um, as you can see, they did uh, this calculation on an event-based uh, uh, event, uh, um, calculation. Uh, they could really reproduce the interference pattern and also this behavior of uh, the uh, attenuators, uh, which is certainly a, a quite a significant quantum effect. And, uh, but one can even increase this effect when you have, uh, for instance, a double loop interferometer and uh, only consider here, here is a beam attenuator, only this one has to consider, and here is a phase shifter. Then you see here, when uh, the transmission is one, you have this behavior, but also when you have here a strong beam attenuation, you can always reach near a uh, hundred percent contrast. Uh, so uh, even when there is a very weak signal behind this attenuator, you can get full uh, interference um, in such cases. And that is even more, more pronounced in this picture, uh, same situation, but here it is shown as a function of this transmission through that. Uh, and here in a deterministic case, and here in a stochastic, or you can say in a quantum uh, case, and you can see the difference between these two pictures are quite substantial, uh, showing this strong uh, effect of a very small, very little signal here. And uh, that, uh, that is uh, certainly uh, because it's really surprisingly uh, low signal and you can get, as you see, uh, full contrast. Um, now, uh, I want also to make a comment on more active neutron apparatus interaction. And one of them is, first of all, when you have a time-dependent field here, a resonance field where you flip the spin in one beam path from above to below, and you superpose it, and what you get, it's easy to show here, omega t, you, uh, you, easily, you can see that you get a Lamour precession behind, even without the magnetic field. So it, it, there is feasible to have Lama precessionals without magnetic field, as it is shown here. And when you analyze that in the right direction and synchronously with the oscillating field, you see again that there is interference. That means there is an energy exchange between the resonator and the neutron. Uh, of one photon, and, but nevertheless, it stays coherent. 
And uh, only to show here, uh, we have also in a separate uh, experiment, high resolution, we have really shown that there is an energy change. Uh, here's the energy, and you see in this case, you have two different kinetic energies uh, of the beam behind such a system, and that is the energy, energy conservation and so on. I only want to show even when there is energy exchange, it remains coherent, and that can be extended. Extended in that sense that um, when you are off resonance, then the situation is quite is, is somehow different. Then you have not only a one photon exchange, absorption emission, but you have multi photon exchange. The interference pattern looks now more complicated, and you can then from that easily calculate the amplitudes of one photon exchange and absorption, two photons, four photons, and so on, you can see, that can be extracted. So there is a quite uh, a, a, a photon exchange, but you see by this also kind of post-selection that uh, the system remains still coherent. And here we did a more com complete analysis of that with such an oscillating field here. As it is shown in one beam path, uh, calculation is a little bit lengthy. Um, I guess I should not go into the details, but it can be done and uh, can, can show it to you. And the interference pattern uh, here is for one frequency, and here it is for two frequencies. You see the interference pattern becomes more uh, difficult, but you can from this data easily extract the probability amplitudes for one photon, two photons, and so on, exchange. And please notice here the plus absorption and emission probabilities are always the same. Um, but nevertheless, um, when you, I think in the next pattern, we have five modes, and then the pattern is even more complicated, as you see it here. And then even you can calculate the photon exchanges. And now, when we are with five modes, you can even go to more and more, and then you can say that is a noise. Yes? But you see, as it is here, it is still deterministic what is the situation and so on. And so it's also in the case when you have a real noise, then what you usually expect is that the interference pattern, it's the dashed lines here, are reduced to the full lines, and when you increase the noise, it's even more reduced, uh, independent whether in the left or right beam. But when you put the same noise into both uh, beam parts, you again uh, retrieve the full contrast. So that means even there is noise le uh, level, but uh, behind it, and, and you can calculate it because it's the same in both beam parts, the beam remains completely coherent, and there is, uh, there is not. So it's not easy to get a defacing or a decoherencing. That's very, very difficult. It appears very often as decoherent uh, when you do not write analysis of that. And uh, yes, I, I wanted also to mention, uh, let's say, what, uh, that's an emergent <laughs> experiment we measured uh, time ago, the neutron fizeau effect uh, that is shown here. You have a moving uh, slab here, and then you get such a phase shift where well, yes, one can calculate it in analogy to light, but here it depends on the velocity of the surface, not of the material, but that's a slight different. And here are the experiments, and uh, you see here this phase shift as a function of the speed 
of uh, such p uh, uh, a sample within the interferometer. And so only to show that this is uh, verified. But um, I, I guess that for me is somehow an emerging um, project. I guess that could be interesting to have an asymmetric change of, uh, of the phase, as it is shown here. Uh, when you rotate such a wheel, you get a periodic variation of the phase, and therefore also an energy exchange. But in this case, to, at least according to the formula, it is asymmetric. That means emission and absorption is different. And uh, that could be even useful for cooling and uh, for all that. Um, it depends in which direction the wheel is rotating uh, in comparison to this profile. So that is something like that. <coughs> okay, and I guess we're reaching yeah, about five minutes, yes, okay. Uh, more uh, recent experiments uh, on contextuality and cotton specker phenomenon that opens a new field. Yuji Hasegawa will report on that tomorrow in more detail. But what I want to say is, let's say that with the neutrons, I guess also here, uh, you can get uh, a kind of entangled states between the beam path uh, that is here, the phase shift, uh, the spin, and the energy. You see here you have the, the two beam paths and, and the phase shifter. Then you have here this Rabi flipper which uh, transfers energy, and you can measure that by the number of Lamo rotations um, here, and you have a spin polarization you can analyze by analyzer crystal. So you have this kind of tripled and tangled uh, wave functions, and you can handle all these parameters. And here you see such a measurement where you have the polarization, where you have here uh, the energy, that means the ro number of rotations, um, uh, lama rotations, and the spatial coordinate is given here in He for all big pictures. And from that, you can prove a lot of uh, um, uh, einstein podolsky relations and uh, Merman uh, and, uh, uh, and inequalities and a similar thing that's uh, becoming our own branch uh, of research, and I guess Yuji will report on that in more detail. And perhaps nobody has mentioned it yet, but I guess there is a new uh, approach coming in, mainly here by these people, Müller, also the well-known Jew, when they analyzed some experiments with atoms, but it's the same with the neutron. I guess with the neutron is even more evident and using the Compton frequency. And I only want to say that in neutron optics or neutron physics, Lama interferometry, spin echo interferometry is well established and so on, but that is uh, related uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the uh, kinetic energy, but not to the zero energy. And here is the well-known cow experiment, uh, done also with the interferometer I've shown before. And when you rotate the interferometer around an axis, you see this interference pattern, and that is given by this formula experiments done quite long ago. And here you have it in comparison with the atom uh, interferometer uh, where you are changing the energy by laser light and also uh, so that they reach different heights. And that also shows you this gravitational effect. But now this out of claim that the Compton frequency, which is extremely high, yes, 
uh, plays a role. And when you apply that also for the neutron case, you can have the usual calculation with the bath integral, you get this result. But here, you can make the calculation by the proper time. And when you use the proper time, yes, not the path in there, but the proper time integral, you end up with the exactly, uh, with the exact uh, equal um, formula. And so uh, there is another approach to this uh, phenomenon or to these measurements, which, uh, which shows it in a completely different light. Uh, but uh, quite interesting. I have also put something together. Uh, advanced post-selection makes quantum experiment better understandable. It gives more core yes, quantum physics gives more co uh, correlation, entanglements, and contextual effect than classical physics. And the, in the interpretation, one should always keep in mind that not only the basic equation, but also the boundary conditions are of equal importance. And perhaps also that is uh, also basic uh, said that we do not, uh, we must be aware that we do not know everything at the beginning. And so we should not, uh, uh, so we also do not know everything at the end. So we should not be so surprised when we have a statistical output, when we have to some sense also a statistical input. In that sense, I reach the end, and thank you very much. So thank you, Helmut, for this very nice overview and for the very nice remarks at the end. So there is time for one brief question. Yes. Uh, have you also been involved in these experiments with neutrinos in the gravitational field of the Earth? Because that was also a very interesting neutrino experiment, very yes. similar to what you have done here. Yes, yeah, I, I mentioned that, this cow experiment. Yes. yes, that is done by our American colleagues, but they have used the same technique which we have developed with this interferometer. And they could not only measure the gravitational effect, but also the Earth rotation effect. Oh, yes, and um, but you see, uh, what is what is here uh, to some sense surprising, and the discussion is even between two Nobel laureates, as you perhaps know in nature, it does is going on uh, whether that is also a correct view uh, to describe it by this proper time effect. Yeah, uh, but you get the same result. Yes, that's. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.